We farm the waste of the sacrifice of the, the rural minorities. That's how I see it. In fact, I see the whole of this now very divisive. Um, particularly when, in Kessingham, for example, I think there's about 2,000 uh, sets of residents affected, and uh, the, the operators have said, hey, we'll build you a sports hall. Um, you know, possibly 80, 100,000 pounds worth. And there's about 60 houses really badly affected, and they're saying, we just want the noise stopped at night, please. And the other residents are saying, no, you be quiet, we want our sports hall. And it just destroys the communities. Um, so I have some passion on this and I have a position on it. I'm not opposed to sensible renewable energies provided the risks and effects are properly evaluated. We do not sacrifice the countryside and its people. And in recent weeks uh, have provided hope that the landscape is changing but it remains the case. Rural communities are being sacrificed and harmed due to noise. Why is the noise is the elephant in the room that's never talked about? On the television, when they talk about it, they never talk about the noise, they always talk about the visual impact. Visual impact is one thing, but getting a good night's sleep, if you're one of that mark, smaller minority, within, say, two kilometres or one and a half kilometres, um, in a what we call a heightened noise zone, then that's a different matter altogether. Harm to well-being? Absolutely. There is now overwhelming evidence that exists of harm to well-being being ignored by government and hidden by the industry for years. And I mean that literally for years. The evidence indicates um, that the gathering of the information of the problems is avoided. Simple thing, record L90 and you don't record this noise aspect. I, a number of times I said, can you please record 100 milliseconds? No, 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 I'm not going to do that. Well, why not? <coughs> What's the problem? Oh, our, our meters won't record it. More, more modern meters will achieve recording 100 millisecond. Um, well, if, they, if they don't, I'll lend them one so they can. They, they, there is just isn't an excuse. Um, when there is an analysis, the wrong data is often recorded and then interpreted as there is not a problem. And I gave you the example about the noise meter which has a noise floor of 20 and the problem is below 20. XOR 97 is the guidance on wind farm noise, as you probably know, and it gives an illusion of protection. Many ingredients of ETSU uh, just give this illusion, but they simply serve to avoid the impediments uh, to wind farm development. The, to, to list them, they only control the quiet content of the noise. It averages the background noise and ignores the quiet periods. It averages the emissions, so you get an average versus an average, and we all know what that does. Um, it ignores, the, it ignores the increased impact inside dwellings. We do all the assessment outside where the, the trees are swishing around and nobody's looking at the internal impact. Um, it assumes noise is benign and masked, so it allows more on that basis. Plus now, it averages the effect of meteorology on the background noise rather than reflect the actual conditions. And that's as a result of the Good Practice Guide by the Institute of Acoustics that came out this year. So let's have a look at it. The lower arrow, arrow, look at my tongue in here, the lower arrow, the LA90, is what Etsy measures, the blue line at the bottom. The average is what we normally use, the, the red line through the middle. But what affects people are the peaks of the pumps and the peaks of the, the beats or washes, which you can see in this particular one are 89 dB higher. Here's an actual graph comparing inside a bedroom when the turbines were turned off on the same night and then later on when they were on, and I can tell you how bad it is in this property, it carried on like this with this spikiness for about four hours that night until the birds uh, were noisier and we got a change in the atmospheric conditions. So if you were trying to sleep, originally with the green line at the bottom, that's a normal background inside the bedroom, um, what you had to leave with is not just the spiky noise above it, what you've been listening to, but much more elevated, about uh, you can see it's gone from about 22 up to about 32. And according to our acquisitions, that's okay. Because they say, the World Health Organization says everyone can sleep with 30 dB in a bedroom. What they don't tell you is that guidance relates to steady noise. Noise like the lower noise. Anonymous noise. I don't think anyone would have any difficulty of saying this is wind farm noise and it certainly is not steady. Uh, this one, uh, very quickly, just gives you a whole load of descriptions about anti-modulation. And uh, some of them just do not look like anti-modulation. 
Some of them do, but some of them you just wouldn't, you wouldn't, a busy road continuous at distance, where you wouldn't think that is a description of aperture modulation. And this, these are all descriptions used by people uh, about amplitude modulation, and it's why the problem is mixed. Your local EHL or authority look at your complaint and think, well, that's normal noise. Some of them they'll recognise it, but a lot of them they won't. And so the consequence is, um, your problems get mixed. So let's look at the problems, let's demonstrate how Etsy fails to work, and listen to some of the noise, which you've already listened to some. Um, and if you want to listen to even more, we've made lots of examples freely available on our website. So, the main problem, it's the character in the wind farm noise. It's excess amplitude modulation. It's a bit like when your neighbours play music through your wall, or if you're in a remote farmhouse, you may not suffer that problem, but I'm sure you've all been in a hotel or somewhere and a car goes by with music play speak on, and you can hear the car go by, boom, 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 as it goes past. You immediately hone in on it. If you do have neighbours directly opposite, you may well have experienced the, the, the youngster playing their loud music. It intrudes as soon as you hear it. it you don't have to wait um, until it gets to a certain decibel level before it, it intrudes. It intrudes because it delivers a message to you who are listening. Even when you're asleep, you are listening and you receive messages from sounds. That's why when your partner whispers in your ear something, you know, it's intruding downstairs. They don't have to shout above 30. You wake up, it, or if there's an unusual noise, you wake up. You are listening all the time, and this is the problem. And the annoyance grows, uh, the more it intrudes on your life, the more occasions, and particularly if it happens in, during the evenings at night, and at night when you expect to have some rest. Control of EAM, excess amplitude modulation, is rejected by government and the industry, who rely on the old inadequate study, well, an old study, I say old, like 2007, uh, containing very serious mistakes. Very helpful to the industry, though. So we have this failed illusion of control uh, that is presented, which equals, it meets the guidance of XL97, it's okay. It's a completely false facade hiding what's going on behind. So the government and industry argue, well, this guidance was recently reviewed by the Institute of Acoustics, so it must be okay. Um, and it provides false alarms of low impact. So let's have a look at that. Exley considered AM noise and included it. That's one of the arguments. Uh, it's in its limits. It's addressed. That's what they say. All wind farms tested comply with Exley. Well, I think I know of one marginal case, half a decibel out. So I think that's a fair argument. They do all comply with Exu. You're suited to be protected, therefore. And you can have confidence, as the guidance has recently been reviewed. Trust us, we've done all the checks. It's all okay. So it means you complain that it's so unreasonable, as it complies. You must be too sensitive to noise. Compared to most people, perhaps you're anti wind for turbines, so as soon as you hear it, you're hey, banging and, and whatever, just because of your your attitude. That's the attack. The facts. AM, including next in limits, is different and insignificant. Let's have a look at them. Let's take the left hand side, EXU AM. Its maximum peak to trough is 2 to 3 dB. Those graphs, when it got really big in the middle, were about 8. Um, but that's only close to the turbines, 50 metres from the turbines. In theory, by EXU, it reduces over distance, so it's definitely smaller than 2 dBA peak to trough. Do you remember the graph I put up with the internal noise against the background when you don't have the turbines? Well, that internal noise was about going up and down 1 to 2 dBA. So that's what you'd expect the EXU AM to be. And it's 800 to 1000 hertz mid frequency. All what you were listening to was way below that, much lower frequency than that. Um, you don't hear it inside, it doesn't say that next but that's the inference that comes out of it, and its contribution is minor. Let's compare it to what you actually experience. Between 2 and 13, in fact in some cases up to 15 dBA peak to trough. So in other words, within a, within a fraction of a second, the noise rises 15 dB, so that's more than twice as loud and drops again in a fraction of a second. It increases over distance up to about 1500 meters. So the peak to trough can get bigger as you go further away, and it gets more low frequency, it gets more thumpy as you go further away. 
and then it reduces again. Its frequency range is about 125 hertz, sorry if this is for the technical people, up to about 630 hertz. So a crow um, is about 500 hertz, the noise a crow makes about 500 hertz. So it's lower than a crow, and the 125 hertz is, the, is touching on what you'll start to get from the bass speed of, of music. Um, it's often worse inside than outside. You can get bigger pitcher chops inside because of the reverberation effects in the room than you do outside. Um, and it usually dominates, completely dominates the noise environment. You've got a completely industrialized noise now. It's highly intrusive, even at very low decibel levels. So that is what is not included by ETSU. And the argument of government or the industry that it's already dealt with is frankly nonsense. Some of the other facts. It's correct that all wind farms tested comply. But there are major complaints we know from at least 80 sites, um, and we estimate there's at least, we think, about double that, about 160 sites causing complaints. But a lot of people won't complain for good reason. The statistics show that about a fifth to less than that, maybe a tenth of our population will complain. So we're not a natural society of, as soon as there's a problem, making an official complaint to a local authority. There's so many reasons for that. People have other coping strategies. So either most rural residents are unreasonable people, or the guidance is wrong. Now, I know which one I put my faith in, and I, I must be an unreasonable person as well, because I've heard it at so many properties now. Plus, we had the XC review actually allowed more noise by stealth. Um, and there's arguments about that, but every case, every single case where I compared the methodologies, it allows more noise. Most people complain uh, after a period of time because they cannot live with the noise, not because of an anti attitude. As soon as they hear it, they don't say, Right, local authority, I'm banging on the door, I can hear the wind farm. Most of them will say, Well, I've got it now, I'm going to have to try and live with it. And it's only after they find they can't live with it, then they're forced to make complaints. So we've got 90% plus of all the wind farms causing complaints are about amplitude modulation. It's inherent. Even ones that are tonal or have other problems, they're also complaining about this fluctuation in the noise. The evidence of excess AM has been widely missed uh, as the cause um, of the problems due to a lack of understanding, uh, just in the descriptors. The Salford study used descriptors and decided that most of them wasn't AM. We've reanalyzed them and looked at the wind farms, they said, no, that's not AM. And they're all AM. They just got it so wrong. Why did they get it wrong? Well, because they had no experience. They hadn't spent weeks or days or even hours listening to it. So they had no knowledge of what they were trying to assess. And from my experience, people just complain about wind farm noise. Few know what it's supposed to sound like. So if they say, it sounds like an aeroplane that never arrives, I immediately know what that description now is they're talking about. And it is AM. Um, but you ask some of the other professionals who've never heard it, and they'll say, no, that's not AM. So there's very powerful evidence that the, the descriptors are misunderstood. We've now done a field study on 13 wind farms. 100% of those wind farms generated AM every time we visited them. So it's not a case that we went out 100 times and we found it 10 times. We went out to 13 wind farms, and each and every one of them was causing AM when we went. Because we had 100% correct projection, because we had to learn to understand um, what generates it. So we were able to go exactly where we know it's going to happen, and exactly under the conditions that we know it's going to happen. So there's another way in you can't predict it. Absolute uncom. If we can do it at 100%, and at 100% of um, now 13 wind farms, I think is a pretty powerful uh, statistical uh, element. You know, it's 10% of all those we think cause it. So uh, how can you ignore such a statistical number? Uh, we know where to look, when to look, and, and how to look, and what to record. And the important thing is what to record. And I, I presented a paper on this in, in Denver, Colorado, uh, in August. What I didn't know is the Japanese have been doing work for three years on a major study on 34 wind farms, and they come along and they made two very important statements. A, yeah, an amplitude modulation was generally contained in wind farm noise, so it's not rare. 
it basically, about 76% of the time they found it. And the AM contained causes serious annoyance. So I, I, I tell Japanese is quite honest people. This is for the Japanese government, this study. And it's a major study using several uh, institutes and, and, and universities and so on. Um, and they very clearly uh, set out the, 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 the information. We have another study from South Korea, the et al, that identified all turbines emit this, this type of AM. It has directional effects leading to hot spots. We've tested that and found it to be correct. Low frequency dominates over distance, so it gets more pumping. We've tested that, it's correct. And there is impulse content, i.e. it's not a slow rise and fall, it's a sudden rise in, in noise. And then there's recent papers from Sweden, Germany, China, Italy, Australia, Canada, USA, and Holland, and others, all identifying the same thing. And yet in the UK, we've still got, it's rare. I've just listed some of them there, I'm not going to spend any time on that page. So it remains the position of the UK government and industry, despite all the contrary evidence from August and before of this year, that it's rare. I was fighting last week in a planning inquiry where the argument was, still, it's rare. When it occurs, they say, if it does occur, it's not serious or it's not for long. Um, and anyway, the communities are protected by the other powers. Those responses to me are reminiscent of the denials of the denials of the tobacco industry and the asbestos injuries, industries back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and now I think they accept, you know, there are serious health effects. So we have this continuing denial and refusal to accept controls, and I was really interested about the energy side of it this morning. Um, but that makes them responsible for the large increase in complaints and problems in rural communities, the long-term damage to those communities, uh, that some people are abandoning their homes or parts of their homes either semi-occasionally or permanently, they go and stay with relatives, they move to the back bedroom, they can't use the front of the house. I've got so many clients in that situation, it's getting, uh, I can't cope, we can't cope as a company with the, with the number of cases that we've got. Um, and then we've got the well-being of minorities in rural areas being sacrificed either for policy or profit. And I just, I can't have any trouble with that. I can't accept that we can do that in a modern uh, democracy. And this massive feeling that no one is listening or cares. So we've funded our own research, more than the government and the industry have put in, if you want to look to do it in pound signs, and visited 13 sites, which we've now measured, and we have data for four more. We've got this permanent monitoring we set up at Cotton Farm, with local funding to assist that, producing very powerful data, um, and the case is being made public. You can all go on the web website and download this data and do analysis on it. Um, if you can't quite see on the website there, there is an underscore between remote and data. But I will make this available on our website so you can, you can get the information. And what we so far found, between a third and half of all nights, there is about 5 dBA, I, I put it that way because it depends on what part of the year you're looking at. Um, there's a 5 dBA peak to trough. That's, in other words, that's not minor, that's, that's quite serious. In uh, New Zealand, that would automatically trigger um, that it's not complying, and the same in South Australia. Upwind AM can be as bad as downwind AM, and we've got some very interesting information coming out on that. And the other really important one is that prediction procedures wholly understate impact, and we will be producing papers on that next year because the prediction procedures simply are wrong under certain conditions. Dr. Bullmore of Hor Lee may have come across, for the developer in the cotton wind farm case, um, who is not a nuisance expert, said, given the very small number of occurrences of increased levels of blade swish, or AM, it is my view that an appropriate way to control the potential for the noise from a wind farm to, to contain increased levels of AM is by way of statutory nuisance action. I can tell you as a nuisance expert, to be my main field of work for 38 years, Statutory nuisance has failed every case so far and is incapable, and I mean that, incapable of addressing the issues. There are so many ways to undermine statutory nuisance. It doesn't take someone like me five minutes to write a report how to destroy the statutory nuisance action. And even if you lost as the developer in the magistrate's court or the sheriff's court here, and then subsequently in the Crown Court, because if you can appeal against the Crown Court, you're now about five years on, the time you got to the end of that second appeal, 
You simply change the company that controls it, and that's happening all the time with Wind and you have to start the entire process again. It's so simple for, to opt out of statutory nuisance. And it, it just beggars belief that we've got acousticians who are not experts in this field making statements of this nature. So what did I say about inquiry? I said the risk of AM was high and has long been underestimated and the condition was essential. The inspector rejected my concerns and he said, I place greater weight on the results of the Salford study than on the research carried out by Mr Stigwood. It is simply not possible to predict in advance, even though I've done so by then about six times and now um, 13 times, simply not possible to predict in advance statistically the odds are very much against it being a problem at Cotton Farm. I appreciate that some similarity with problem sites, he was talking about um, even St Nicholas then, some people may know, but not to the extent that it can reasonably be regarded as a distinct possibility, let alone probability. Um, he's wrong on both. He's wrong on all of it. The community suffer, he doesn't, and nor does those who decided it wasn't a problem. The early community response is, a considerable number of noise complaints by res residents have been made to the environmental health officers. We're eight months on, by the way, now. Each village appears to be affected at different times. Three major villages affected. Depending on the wind direction and speed, the action group is also aware of residents who have been affected by turbine noise but have not formally complained yet. Despite those problems, Hayes Mackenzie Partnership, so let's switch now from Hawley to Hayes Mackenzie, went out and measured and said, well, it complies with ETSU and noise could be increased. In other words, you could up the power output of the turbines. So, eight months. Um, of the council's failing to act on the nuisance situation, and then the um, consultant comes along for the developer and says, well, actually, you can turn your turbines up and generate more power and generate more noise. And they know, because I cross examined Dr. McKenzie from the Hayes McKenzie Partnership, they know they've measured amplitude modulation at those villages. So, what makes it worse now is the site is owned by a company, owned mainly by the UK government. So what's the industry position? Trust us, we're looking at it. They, 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 they've had a study looking at it for three years now. They were due to report two years ago, and we still wait. Supposedly it's coming out this December. But there's been no public consultation on their work. All their data is withheld on all of their research on wind farms. And they've even made the IOA working group sign confidential clauses not to divulge what's in their research. But when it does come out, well, believe us, we've got it right, we'll solve the problems. What about all the people in the meantime, even if they are right? What did I do? Well, I developed a condition in 2009, basically, that said if it's a three decibel peak to trough, then it's too much, and it, it invokes the condition, and you've got to deal with it. And I was immediately attacked by industry in every conceivable way you can imagine. Um, and even the Institute of Acoustics, and I say this publicly, gave biased access to publishing of the industry's position. But when I went to respond to that, they said, no, you can only have a couple of columns, and we'll edit what you put in. And they did. Um, the arguments attacking the Denver condition, rare, now proven to be wrong, absolutely. Not just on our evidence, look at what the Japanese found. Falsely triggered, now proven as wrong. And also, I've had uh, acousticians admitting it's wrong. The press, we, we put a method of you can test it on our website, and the press even come back and said it's stupidly easy uh, to, to, to differentiate between false triggers and, and wind farm noise. Um, the 3 dBA value, not supported, not tested, now wrong, I'll come back to that. And it's a meaningless mechanism. Now, uh, a nonsense argument, basically ignoring logic, but I'll come back to that. But those attacks have been accepted for four years meaning communities like Cotton Farm and possibly many of yours have gone on unprotected and now without conditions and without recourse to the problems, to solving the problems. What's the current position on Denbrook? Um, there is evidence of 100% occurrence at every site. So now it's very strong evidence that you need a Denbrook style condition. Um, so the Denbrook condition was the one that I developed with the 3 dB limit, yeah? And that actually, for those who may not be aware, it actually went to the High Court and it went to the Court of Appeal to test whether it was a valid condition and it was held to be a valid condition. But the argument back was that they didn't test the metric. They didn't test if 3 dBA is right. The false trigger argument is now accepted by most as invalid, invalid uh, at inquiries. Um, I think I've already covered that one, so I don't go back. 
Not tested. Well, you've now seen I've tested it at 13 where we've measured and another four where we've got data, 17 sites we've tested it, it works. It fits with complaints. So there's overwhelming evidence that it has been, and there's emerging evidence that it should be lower than 3 dBA. If you look at the Japanese study, the line in the sand is 2 dBA. And if you look at an old DTI study in 2006, that suggested 2 dBA. And the meaningless has been defeated by a report by the Institute of Sound and Vibration Research in Southampton. So what's the situation, the finale on round two? The developer, Res, has withdrawn all attempts to change the condition. They basically try and get it buried. They've now dropped all that and they agree it can work. Dr. Jeremy Bass, who has put a lot of YouTube videos out saying, oh no, 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 you won't have a problem and all this that this comes up with this rubbish, um, raised the false trigger argument said uh, in, in 2007 that they have abandoned what they describe as the industry line, this is just a couple of weeks ago, that AM is rare, that no AM condition is necessary, and that it could be dealt with by a statutory nuisance. And I, I'm thankful for this next line that you probably didn't know was being uh, noted, that that idea has been completely exploded by the weight of evidence presented by Mike Stephen in particular. So thank you, Jeremy. After attacking me for years, I'm pleased you're recognising uh, now uh, what the evidence is showing. And only three or four days ago, three days, four days ago, Dr. Matthew Cand from Hawley, who is on the Renewables UK Research Group, and after the wealth of evidence was put in front of him at an inquiry, and two hours of his cross-examination admitted that a condition was necessary, a Pine AT condition was reasonable, to legal tests. And if I had to pick a number, I don't think 3 dBA, 3 dBA, yes, is a bad number. So, four years of obfuscation and misinforming decision makers now admitted the Denver condition was at the appropriate level, is reasonable and necessary. You might want to tweak with the way you do it, that's different. Who now is going to address all those cases without control where communities are exposed to serious noise impact? Is government and most IOA working group members going to continue arguing it does not now need control, as if you read their guidance it suggests? Will decision makers now treat with caution what the industry and its acquisitions tell them? Let's look at their good practice guide. I'll move on from amplitude modulation. Just looking at normal wind farm noise, which actually really is AM most of the time. The working party was dominated by industry acquisitions of the known persuasion. But what I mean is they had previously signed up to a particular idea. The, the majority of them. They adopted a method allowing more noise, about 5 dBA higher. It's a hugely complex procedure, basically impenetrable to most. So, I assert this, they assert otherwise, and a planning inspector or a recorder in, in, uh, up here, a reporter, sorry, up here, just goes, whoa, I've got no idea. Who will I believe? Well, there's the weight of, it, of uh, acquisitions saying Mr. Stephen is wrong. Do I believe in a minority or do I believe the industry is my majority? No research supports the method or its concept, which has been introduced. And two research papers, one by ourselves, where we compared five wind farms using the two methods, and one by the Renewable Energy Foundation, show it allows substantially more noise. And people have argued that, oh, your research, no, no, there's flaws in it, but I've seen no real tangible flaw to any of it. At the same time, wind farm noise gets worse. This is all going on. At the same time, wind farm noise gets worse because we have larger turbines, which means more low-frequency noise, which penetrates dwellings and is more annoying. We have excess amplitude modulation impact, which dramatically now increases for the percentage of time it occurs. And we have intrusive, increasing intrusive characteristics, not just AM. Things like syncopation, you know, so you get the whoom, 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 a, bit, a very bad um, uh, explanation, but it changes, it jumps. So even if you're getting into a pattern of the noise and thinking, I could almost see this as music trying to knock me to sleep, it suddenly changes completely. And if you were knocking me to sleep with it, you're awake again which is what I'm trying to do now to prevent people from after lunch um, to sleep. And the greatest impact is during the evenings and at night, when you are seeking quiet relaxation, not during the daytime. 
During all of that, our government approves a method allowing increased noise levels by stealth. The historical approach under EXU and generally for industrial noise equals the decibel limit tracks the level of masking noise present in the environment. So as masking noise goes up, you can allow more industrial noise. Um, so when you have a clear night, taking the box at the bottom, with no wind near the ground, so there's very little masking noise, the limit becomes lower. Therefore, if they generate more noise, if they want to turn the turbines up full, because the wind up at the hub is at full speed, that's what happens on clear nights when you have a thing called high wind shear. You get high winds at the turbine hub and very low winds near the ground. When you get those circumstances, um, then the old method of ETSU, would, the, the limit would come lower. And as a consequence of that, they couldn't generate so much noise. The current Institute of Houston's idea equals, as the turbine noise increases, the decimal limit increases. And they say that's like for like. They say that's logical. It's not when you look at what the principles of the limit is. It's to protect the community, not to protect the wind farm, to, 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 to have a limit that goes up when its noise goes up. Where's the logic of that? Sometimes, as wind turbine noise increases, the masking noise will also increase. But sometimes, as the wind turbine noise goes up, the masking noise either drops or stays where it was. So the protection goes. Now that happens, that latter one happens during the night and uh, typically about a third of the time and during the evenings. So the time you lose, the time you need the most protection is the time that you now lose it under the new methodology. So what it means is you no longer look at what happens on an individual night, which is what ETSA intended, um, but you look at long term averages. That's the way they've all been assessed since. In effect, four out of seven nights might be masked. And if that's the case, on average, you've got more times that the noise is masked than it's not, so it's okay. So uh, typically, on 70, 60 percent, it's okay, then it's deemed not a problem. That's the way it's now looked at. So the fact you don't get three nights sleep a week is, when, if you do on four nights, on average, you get more sleep than you don't, so it's okay. Um, it's like saying I was not responsible for an accident when I was driving too fast, as my average speed over the week was below the limit. I mean, that is exactly what they're trying to say. And I, I love the statistic in London, the average speed of a vehicle in London is 17 miles an hour. So on that basis, I don't think anyone's ever been killed, have they? And yet, is it, in the last month we've had six cyclists killed in London. It's just ridiculous. Um, government endorsed the guide as the IOA is independent. The IOA dominated uh, by industry acquisitions, that is. Um, the IOA working party is dominated by wind industry consultants and the working party dominated by those of a known persuasion allowing more noise. Now the government prosper as their own companies who buy problem wind farms like Cotton Farm, they permitted through inadequate rules, they applied. Now that might seem a bit harsh, but that is how it looks to a lot of people. I won't go for that one, there probably isn't time. Some of the facts. It industrializes the countryside, it impacts more during the evenings and at night. Some people are badly affected at low, by low frequency noise and infrasound, and there's arguments about, oh, does infrasound have an effect? But I have, I've got a resident who's abandoned his home, and I got to come back to the home to stay there when I stayed there, and it was quite amazing when I saw his eyes literally turn, the whites turn red. And he was in a state after about 24 hours now, maybe he's invented it, he's a very clever actor for years, he probably, if he could put drops in his eyes to make it go red, he's doing very well at uh, convincing me, but he did not look well to me, and in the end, he left. Now, okay, circumstantial, maybe, but then we have studies come out from America about babies that cry their eyes out when they are at the home, and when they move five miles away, they didn't cry anymore. And someone challenged that and said, well, I'm a GP, we called that colic in the trade, and some, some very senior acousticians jumped up and basically um, said, no, we were involved in that study. That baby was fine when it was away, but when it went back to the property, it just cried through the night. Now, okay, circumstantial or what, you just cannot ignore the body of evidence. Or precaution in principle, we need to look at it. The imbalance is sacrificing the quality of the life of the minority, even on the noise you can hear. Forget the noise you can't hear. 
Some people don't like this approach, but I think we should compare the Hillsborough tragedy, not the tragedy, obviously it's not the same as that, but I mean the way it's how it handled. We can learn from that tragedy when inquiry after inquiry came to the wrong conclusions on such a serious matter, it was not a selection of stupid people um, on those inquiry boards, but perhaps zealots who could not accept error by the police and the state institutions. The wind farm problem and renewable, renewable industry may suffer a similar disease in the pursuit of their cause and with subtle cover up by those who think wind farms at any cost. I am concerned over the state's role and the lasting damage to our society of the impact on a rural minority and yet another, uh, well, look what they did with the Jimmy Savile, look what they did with Hillsborough. This may not be in the same league in some ways, but it's destroying people's homes and their communities. Um, many suffer serious noise to the extent they either abandon their homes or parts of them. And just to make a point, nobody abandons their home without good cause. Uh, industry words remind me again of the tobacco industry and the uh, asbestos injury industry 40 years ago. Trust us, it's safe. The evidence of harm is not there. We are subject to rigorous controls. Benefits outweigh the harm. Do you remember the time, uh, some of you will, go and have a cigarette on your nerves? Sorry, some of you still might, but I, so I don't want to write you. Now, I'm a private individual running a business, and it could not be more unprofitable to spend the huge resources we are researching this issue and taking on the industry. But we have, because there are sometimes issues you just can't ignore, you can't turn it back on. The answer is overwhelming, it's a serious problem. I cannot countenance a response that the industry or the state are now unaware, because I have personally made the Secretary of State aware. I was supposed to have an hour meeting. It turned out eight minutes in the end because he was, he was called to vote in the House. But during that minute meeting, he was played AM for our church, so he knew what it was about. The evidence the industry has suppressed the, the evidence the industry has suppressed the evidence of a problem is now exposed. Listening rooms. Any listening experience needs to be carefully constructed. I cannot provide such an experience in this hall today, so you've got to be careful. There are uh, extracts on our website you can go and have a listen to and compare the one that Nabs Ridge, there's a car at the start and then it goes into the wind farm noise. If you cannot extract the car from the wind farm noise, then obviously um, you fall into the industry of conditions you can't differentiate wind farm noise from other sources. But I, I would suggest that everyone in this room can easily uh, assess the difference between extraneous noise sources and wind farm noise. And I just fail to understand why there is resistance to the control other than for policy or profit. I've given you the, the um, web address there, so you can go and have a listen yourself. Um, and the levels here today are elevated, just making that point I made right at the beginning, but they are to give you an idea of the character. Um, go on, I'm not going to um, talk about our findings in more detail. As you can see, I've got all slides for you to the point where you really want to go to sleep. Perhaps just to stop at that one. I forget the year of this, 2008 I think, major inquiry abroad uh, in, in the Netherlands that basically demonstrated on an annoyance scale of highly annoyed how wind turbines compare to all these other sources. And yet they are allowed, depending how you calculate it, between about 7 and 20 decibels more noise in an environment than these other sources, but certainly than industrial noise, which isn't shown on there, but industrial noise would fall between the wind farms and between the aircraft line. You'd get, you'd get industrial noise falling somewhere between those two. But wind farm noise is allowed substantially more noise impact than all of the others. And it just doesn't make sense, other than if you're just trying to achieve a policy. Um, in fact, I do that on that graph where I compare um, benign industrial noise against <coughs> rural area wind turbine noise and, and how they are, are assessed by the, for the, the technical minded. My final point is either uh, to answer any questions or to play some more wind farm noise.